August is here, and that means that the weather and the election cycle are heating up. The best way to beat the heat and stay up to date on the latest news from the U.S. election to international breaking headlines is to become a DSR member and gain access to additional content across our network in addition to other exclusive benefits. Use code BEATTHEHEAT to get 50% off of your membership and sign up today at the dsrnetwork.com slash buy. That's beat the heat at the dsrnetwork.com slash buy. Now please enjoy the show. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. Republicans are officially starting to panic about the surge in enthusiasm among Democrats over Kamala Harris's candidacy. According to a striking new Politico report, Many GOP operatives are sounding a loud alarm about a big disparity in fundraising that's now opened up between the parties, leaving GOP Senate and House candidates underfunded and in serious danger of losing. Which raises a question. Though polls still show a very close presidential race and Democrats still face tough odds in Senate and House races, does the -the on-the-ground enthusiasm and organizing constitute a hidden advantage for Democrats one that can make a real difference on election day. Today, we're talking about this with Leah Greenberg, who has direct and constant experience of these matters as co-founder of the progressive group Indivisible. Great to have you on, Leah. Great to be here. So the Politico story is eye-opening. It reports that there was a massive surge in grassroots fundraising just after President Biden left the race and Kamala Harris became the Dem nominee. Not surprising, but now... The House GOP campaign chair warned that his party's challengers lag behind Dem House incumbents by like $37 million, and operatives overseeing the Senate GOP's races are admitting that massive spending by Senate Democrats is putting winnable races at risk for Republicans. Politico calls all this panic. Uh, Leah, this seems like more than the usual garden variety scare tactics designed to get donors to open their wallets. It appears to be genuine, don't you think? I think it's genuine and I think I think it reflects the reality that there there is in fact a growing and widening enthusiasm gap, right? We're seeing on our side record fundraising numbers, the kinds of fundraising totals that are allowing the Harris campaign to resource state and local level efforts. Uh, and on their side we are seeing we are seeing them struggle. The Harris campaign announced today that it's uh, donating $25 million to down ballot democratic efforts. This includes House and Senate races, but critically It also includes state legislative races. I mean, that's uh, uh, both a sign of of real flush resources for the Harris campaign and a sign in in real confidence that some of these down ballot races can be won at, at scale, don't you think? I think it's I think it's a sign of confidence, but I also think it's a smart strategy. There are a lot of these places where the target races that you want to win in the state legislature and the places where you want to get out the vote for a statewide effort to win the Electoral College are the same place. Uh, there are a lot of these state legislatures where control of that legislature is going to determine the conditions in which we are voting and in which we are counting votes in the next uh, next couple of elections. There are governorships that can potentially help to mobilize people for the Electoral College or make the difference in, in another uh, gen- cycle or two in whether we are uh, able to get our votes counted. So what I see in that investment is a decision not only to uh, try and do things that will help win right now, but also try and help do things that will help build a governing majority and stave off the next wave of mega attacks. I think it's really important for people to understand what you mean by that. It's that doing this kind of investment in these down ballot races actually makes winning at the top of the ticket easier later. Easier may not be the right word, but it facilitates winning at the top of the ticket. As you say, governors uh, you know, run major organizing efforts in swing states, and state legislatures help set the voting rules, and control of legislatures kind of prevents uh, Republicans from eroding democracy. I, I, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a perennial story that people who work on these state-level races constantly complain that donors are like, 
eh, I don't really care about state legislative races, but they should. <laughs> I mean, they're really important. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I think one of the things that we have learned from hard experience over the last couple of Democratic administrations is how important and how much they will set the conditions in which you are playing for the next cycle, the next five cycles, right? In 2010, when we lost the House, we also lost a ton of state legislative seats. That was actually the path by which Republicans were able to set the terms with gerrymandering for the next cycle. And we spent the next 10 years dealing with that. And we're still dealing with the fallout of that in some ways. It's it's really amazing. I mean, Democrats were caught napping in those state legislative contests, as they themselves, I think, would admit. And we're still dealing with the fallout. It's terrible. Um, back to the Harris surge for a sec. I, I think a lot of people are wondering how durable the surge for her is. The Politico story reports, tellingly, I think, that some top GOP donors are privately raising questions about whether her polling support is actually here to stay. Now, Harris is only up by a small margin right now in the polls. It's super close. She does appear to be ahead, though. What's your sense of, from what you're seeing, how durable the current state of the race is? Well, look, what we're seeing is that we are heading into the fall. We're heading into September with a small but real advantage. Uh, I think nobody would tell you, nobody in the Harris campaign, nobody uh, on the outside would tell you that we've got this in the bag. That's just a, that would be a wildly overconfident thing to say. And also there are a lot of indicators around enthusiasm, around the energy of our base, fundraising being one of them, but certainly not the only metric by which you can assess that, uh, that indicate that the momentum is on our side. Well, let's talk about the Senate because this is one place where it's going to be tough. Politico reports, interestingly, that Six of the eight of the top Senate Dem candidates uh, are outspending their Republican opponents, some by tens of millions of dollars on the airwaves. Now, presuming Joe Manchin's West Virginia seat is lost, Republicans will be up to net one more to take control. And numerous Dem incumbents face incredibly hard races like Sherrod Brown in Ohio, John Tester in Montana, and many others face just medium hard races. It, it's it's rough. It's rough out there for Senate Democrats. What's your take on it? Is the Senate salvageable for Dems at this point? The Senate's absolutely salvageable. So yes, it's a tough map. It is the toughest map. Uh, we are defending a bunch of targets, some in some of the key presidential states, right, like Wisconsin and Michigan, some in states that are harder targets like Ohio and Montana. And also when you're looking at the polling for these candidates, pretty much everyone but Tester is consistently polling ahead of their Republican opponent. It's not just yeah. about outspending. It's about the facts uh, on the ground. Uh, and we do have the money to maintain uh, a really strong message heading into the fall. And we've got some space and time to catch up on, in Montana. And frankly, we're even hearing some optimistic murmurings coming out of Texas and Florida. Yeah, the Texas race is very interesting, I think. Um, yeah. What's striking to me is that uh, the chances of winning the Senate, as we say, are pretty high for Republicans, yet Democrats still are, are getting the resources to, to really outspend their opponents. So, so where is this Democratic money coming from? From where I'm sitting, it looks to me like there's this sense among the grassroots that they can kind of do the impossible here all of a sudden, right? Ka Kamala Harris entering the race has created this sense of possibility can we actually put an end to the Trump threat and somehow defy the odds and hold the Senate? Maybe. I mean, is that sort of the vibe? Is And how do we account for this kind of emotion? I, I would say it's a couple of different things. I think first, uh, there were a lot of different ways in which we had gotten a sense for a very long time that voters were eager for something that would allow them to move beyond the Trump years. And I don't think anyone quite understood until the candidate switch what potential Vice President Harris had to offer that symbolic hope, right? To be a bridge uh, to a future that did not involve Donald Trump and the MAGA movement and this continual dynamic in which every election is a fight for our democracy. I'm not saying they're going away after this. They're certainly not. But she has a unique ability to talk to voters and say, do you want to go back or do you want to go forward in a way that they can hear and believe because she is a younger and more credible messenger in some core ways? So that's one piece of it. I would also just say, I think that uh, I think there are a couple of different dynamics that are coming back from 2016 that are that are energizing people. So rightly or wrongly, a lot of Democratic voters took away this lesson after 2016 that sexism was this enormous, insurmountable 
uh, problem in a presidential election. And I think that infected the 2020 discourse where people were really saying, we've just got to get the safest candidate. And what that coded for them often was a white man. And now through a series of events, we are in a position to make history, to put a black woman, a South Asian woman, the first woman president in. And a lot of these folks who you know, got started, got started organizing, in my case, the folks I work with, uh, in part because they wanted to get that first female president suddenly see their shot again, right? It's on the horizon that they could actually not only win, but make history. And that is an extraordinarily energizing thing. It's going from an election where your hope was harm reduction and kind of staving off the worst to an election where suddenly a lot more feels possible and on the horizon, not only symbolically, but also if we take the House, if we hold the Senate, in terms of the legislative agenda, we can talk about voting rights and structural democracy reform. We can talk about a national guarantee of reproductive freedom. We can talk about a care agenda. These things are actually possible. It, again, the Senate odds are tough, but they are very doable. So uh, I think it's just this combination of uh, a chance to turn the page and an injection of hope. Yeah. And, and I think maybe the, the dynamic you're talking about here is particularly charged up by Dobbs, isn't it? It sort of strikes me that, and this this is something you will you will probably have a lot of firsthand experience with, and please talk about that if you if you do. But it seems to me that that uh, uh, reproductive rights is just one of those issues that's really tailor made to voter to voter communication. This is the type of thing that people talk about with each other, with family members, with friends. People hear stories about neighbors and friends and family members that are horrible. Um, they have people, loved ones who are in tough situations involving uh, health care and reproductive rights. I mean, we're seeing these candidates who are winning in these surprising places on the Democratic side while talking about their own abortion story. Is there something about this issue that really feeds into that type of voter to to voter communication and energy. Is that is that something you encounter? I think it's absolutely the case that there is something deeply personal, deeply emotional, and deeply animating about reproductive freedom. And, and we do see that, and we have seen that pretty consistently since the Dobbs decision in 2022. It was a really, really core driver that allowed us to dramatically outperform political gravity hold a bunch of key Republic or key purple state governorships that we might not have otherwise won, stave off like a major take I take over the Senate. Um, and in this cycle, we are absolutely seeing that as a, a core message and a core theme to, to hone in on um, both the threat, right? Because there's this threat of what will happen nationally if Republicans take power, but also the promise, because there is real potential for Democrats to actually pass legislation that guarantees uh, meaningful reproductive freedom for everyone. But the other thing that I think is really important about reproductive freedom as part of the story that we're telling is, you know, not everyone is necessarily personally anticipating that they need to exercise their right to reproductive freedom right now or next year or uh, in the immediate future. But it actually helps validate the bigger story that we are telling about the threat that MAGA poses to all of your rights, to your way of life, to uh, the, your schools and to your uh, civil rights and to uh, your your job. Like It validates this overall story about the threat to our democracy, because what we can say is Republicans are coming for everything you care about. And the way that you can tell that they are serious is what they did with reproductive freedom when they had the chance. And so it's actually both a very personal and emotional, but it's also the core way that we validate a broader story about the risk of the MAGA uh, a threat. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, Dobbs, the Dobbs factor and the energy that it's un unleashed really is critical to kind of holding together the anti-MAGA coalition. You brought up 2022 there was a case where this was really clear. Uh, Republicans lost a bunch of extremely winnable statewide races uh, in conditions that were supposedly very good for them uh, because they were running MAGA candidates and also MAGA candidates who were virulently anti-choice. And, and that sort of created an easy argument for a Democrat. Well, easy is the wrong word, but it created an ar a, a legible argument for Dems to make to voters, I think, right? Absolutely. And, you know, the Republican candidate quality crisis continues apace, right? Like Republicans ran a bunch of 
um, you know, a bunch of clowns in 2022, for lack of a better term. And we are seeing some that of those too, dynamics yeah. <laughs> repeat again, right? Yeah. Part of the reason why uh, Sherrod Brown is continually polling uh, above what one might expect for a Democrat in Ohio is because he is running against a literal used car salesman with a long history of uh, inappropriate gaffes and extremist positions. These are the kinds of candidates that it's really easy to link them directly to their most extreme statements. Um, and, and we do benefit from that as well. I want to bring up another side to the story about democratic enthusiasm that I think is often neglected in press coverage. It's that all the energy is resulting in an explosion of volunteering, which all translates into direct contact with voters, uh, which matters, right? I mean, there's sort of a tendency in, in the coverage because it's often so shaped around polls and what Nate Silver says or whatever, why that's the case, I don't know, but it is. Um, that that kind of results in a downplaying of these other metrics in politics that every person who follows this knows matter, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is something you see. Well, let, let me ask it this way: Is um, it seems to me volunteering is a, also a good metric to determine whether this surge of enthusiasm is temporary or not? What are you guys seeing out there on this? Is the volunteering continuing to run strong? What's the state of that? Oh, absolutely. What we are hearing from our folks across the country is that they are experiencing surges of interest and enthusiasm and new people attending whatever they're doing. They're hosting convention watch parties where they simply cannot accommodate all the people who show up. They're organizing buses to go to canvas in places, and there are simply too many volunteers for the local canvassing office to know what to do with them. They are across the board reporting surges of enthusiasm and energy that are unparalleled in recent years. So we had this initial burst, but what I would say is a lot of that initial burst, that like zillions of people in a Zoom call dynamic, that's all translating into organizing. Those people have formed local communities. They are starting to figure out how do they door knock? How do they write letters? How do they show up at a campaign office? How do they fundraise? That is all steadily proceeding apace. And, and those folks are helping to fuel the continued incredible numbers that we are seeing for the campaign and volunteering, for the campaign and door knocking, for the campaign and fundraising as well. It, it kind of reminds me a little of the vibe that we had in 2018, where a lot of the press missed the kind of brute organizing that was happening among ordinary people. Um, that seems to me to be taking place here. Let me ask you, though, um, you know, there's a lot to feel good about if you're a Democrat right now, especially relative to, way, to, to the way you felt probably five weeks ago. Um, but there are all these obstacles, right? There's still the debate. When you... Um, you know, have nightmares about where things are going. What happens? What What's the thing you worry about most? What could go wrong? Gosh, oh, way to, way to uh, take me into my dark place. Well, look, I worry most of all about events beyond our control, right? So escalation in uh, a war in the Middle East, right. uh, bad economic numbers for the next couple of months. Those are the things that uh, I, I do really have concerns about whether we're uh, whether that will shift the conditions and and we'll be back on the defense again. Um, those are those are real, and you know you can always you can always come up with the worst case scenario. But at the moment, the best thing we can do is just keep organizing and keep making sure that everybody who is energized, everybody who's excited, is is getting funneled as fast as they can into some kind of productive uh, vehicle for their energy because. You know, the difference between showing up to that first Zoom call and staying consistently engaged, not just to win this election, but to continue organizing after that election, that's often just as much as like, did somebody invite you to the next meeting? So that's what we're focusing on right now. I worry a lot about the press coverage turning as well. It feels to me like a lot of uh, news organizations are just looking for that thing that will turn yeah. the story around. I think that is that is real, right? I think you are seeing the wild imbalance in the standards for the two different candidates come out over and over and over again. You've got uh, a week in which I can't even believe that I'm saying this out loud, right? A week in which the president, uh, President Trump, and his entourage got in a physical altercation while breaking the law at Arlington Cemetery in a wildly disrespectful attempt to exploit uh, military families, and you also have the press kind of like coming up with any version of whatever they possibly can to try and go after the Harris campaign for being insufficiently accessible. It's a complete double standard. It is absolutely absurd. I do think we'll continue to see that. And, and the best thing we can do is just continue to call it out and point out that, you know, we should we should have the expectation that the press treats both of these people as serious candidates for office and can have some proportionality in 
how they interact with each other. That's really interesting because I think there is a tendency to just sort of give up on that. That, that it's basically right. a lost cause. That there's no way you can get the press to to treat Trump's abnormality as an incredibly important story. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you brought up the Arlington thing. I I've seen headlines and things like that that hint that they're really trying to come up with a way to say that um, Trump is winning the battle over Arlington, and it's just absolutely nuts to me that they would even want to go there to at all to cover it that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's wild. And I think, you know, it's a hard balance for us as outside actors to walk because we ultimately want people to have more faith in the media. We ultimately want to bring as many Americans as possible back to kind of a shared set of trusted sources that we can all reference and go back to because the increasing splitting whereby we just have totally different information universes we consume is part of the problem of polarization and part of how we lose all these folks to Trump. And also, you know, there's a set of folks within the media who I don't think are really grappling with the fact that they're losing a lot of trust on the Democratic side by virtue of the way they're framing some of this stuff as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a real a real thing as well. They seem to take that for granted. So let's just go to the big story here. So Simon Simon Rosenberg put it this way in his newsletter, uh, Democrats just have a bigger and better political machine right now than Republicans do. Um, I feel like this story isn't really widely told that way, with the exception of pieces like this Politico one. Again, because press coverage is so tightly tied to polling, you don't read too often that Trump is just not that engaged in trying to run a good on-the-ground campaign. You don't read too often that he's falling behind by these other on-the-ground metrics that really matter, and I can't account for that. I mean, is that the big story? I think there are a couple of big stories. It is definitely true that by the numbers, the Trump campaign does not have the presence, does not have the organizing heft that the Harris campaign does. The other thing that's worth naming, though, is that Trump has a massive election sabotage operation that's coming into into online, right? He is preparing not only to try to win the election, but also to try to uh, come at the results from 100 different angles in terms of how they sabotage it and how they try to make a justification to to deliver the election to him. Now, I hesitate with how I frame that because I think that sometimes it can demobilize people. Sometimes it can make them nervous. And I think ultimately the best way that we're going to prevent any of that from being relevant is by blowing him out of the water in a whole bunch of states in ways that make it not worth the fight to actually try to contest. But I do think that's worth naming when we talk about where the campaign's resources go. They are putting a lot of money into lawyers and legal challenges because they are trying to win this or they are trying to take power however they can. I think it's really important what you said there, which is that um, there's a potential demobilizing effect and pointing to this kind of stuff. In fact, I think that's kind of why Trump and his allies often kind of boast about their, you know, election theft yeah. plans. <laughs> it's it's basically right. in order to scare uh, Democratic partisans into thinking it's a lost cause. He's going to win no matter what. There's no point in, in trying. The system's, you know, it, it's yeah. not, it's not, a, it can't be overcome. I mean, this is just a hallmark of this kind of autocratic politics. And you're on the ground, uh, with with uh, Democratic organizers a fair amount. What's the impact of that stuff? Do you think it actually yeah. does have a demobilizing effect or, or what? Our folks are very practical. So uh, they do they work on what they can control. And what I tell folks when I when we talk about this threat about election sabotage is, look, if it comes down to one state, we're going to be in a tough fight and we'll work and we'll be prepared for that moment. So we'll be, you know, the best lawyers in the country are on the case already. They're working on it. They're ready. We'll have plans if we need to to uh, take action if we're in that position. But the best protection we have, the best insulation against being in that position is to win multiple states. Because fundamentally, if the Trump campaign thinks that they can get to the White House by overturning the results in just Georgia alone, that's one world. If they need to overturn the results in Georgia and Arizona and Nevada and Wisconsin to get to the uh, White House, they're not going to be able to do that. And they're going to have to back off. So fundamentally, the thing that we can control is the margins by which we win and how many places we win to put it out of their out of their potential contention. That is certainly the safest route forward. Uh, let's hope voters <laughs> let's hope voters see it that way as well. Leah Greenberg, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Pleasure to be here. Folks, please check out some good new content we have up at TNR.com. Grace Seegers arguing that 
Kamalamentum is actually creating an opportunity to flip the Wisconsin state legislature, which would be a big win for Dems. And Michael Tomaski looking at recent media failures and asking, is it really possible that the media might be about to help Trump fail his way back to the White House again? We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 